Welcome to our special book event today in which uh, we are going to hear about the new book, The Behavioral Code, The Hidden Ways the Law Makes Us Better or Worse. Uh, my name is Carrie Kalanisi, and I am the director of the Penn Program on Regulation and a member of the faculty here at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and it's my distinct uh, pleasure to welcome all of you today and to introduce to you uh, the author of The Behavioral Code, uh, one of the co-authors, uh, Benjamin Van Roy, who along with Adam Fine, criminologist at Arizona State University, uh, have recently published this book that comprehensively looks at the ways in which law can shape behavior. Ultimately, if we are going to use law as a vehicle for solving problems in the world, uh, it's going to work by changing behavior, by inducing compliance, uh, assuming the rules are well calibrated to solving the problems, that compliance will then uh, lead to a better world. And uh, to help us uh, with that uh, general challenge and to introduce us to this magisterial work that is both comprehensive and highly accessible and highly readable, and I recommend it uh, to all of you. To help us through that uh, is Benjamin Van Roy, uh, who I'd like to introduce. He's a professor of law and society at the University of Amsterdam and a professional researcher at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. He's an expert on regulatory theory, law enforcement, compliance, lawmaking, environmental law, and Chinese law. Uh, he is currently a co-editor of the international peer-reviewed journal, Regulation and Governance, as well as editor-in-chief of the journal, China Law and Society Review. Uh, Professor uh, Van Roy studies how legal rules shape individual and organizational behavior. Uh, he draws on broader social and behavioral sciences to understand why people comply with the law. Uh, what are the effects of organizational and corporate cultures on the compliance equation? Uh, and his research uh, is empirical. Uh, it's theoretical, it draws on uh, widely on and, and contributes to uh, literatures in regulatory law, criminology, and the sociology of law. Most recently, in addition to co-authoring uh, The Behavioral Code, uh, he is the co-editor of the Cambridge Handbook of Compliance. Uh, I'm delighted to turn the screen over to Benjamin, and who will talk about the book. Uh, after uh, his opening remarks, we will have time for audience questions, which we invite you to enter into the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. And I will try to get to as many of those questions as time permits. With that, uh, Benjamin, thank you for being here. Really delighted uh, to have this conversation about your important new book. Gary, thank you so much for having me here and everybody at the Penn Program on Regulation for making this possible. It's a true honor uh, and pleasure to be here at, 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 at one of the prime centers for the study of regulation. Um, I first of all also want to express uh, Adam Fines, my co-author's thanks for having us here and also his regret for not, not being able to share us here today uh, because he had to uh, be somewhere else where he really could not uh, be here today, but he really wished he were here instead of where he had to be. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about the ways in which law gets to shape human and organizational behavior. And I think this is really a core question in the study of regulation, also the practice of regulation. My own background comes from studying uh, the ways in which the Chinese national regulators, the environmental regulators, try to control pollution. And I started to study this in 2000 by doing local studies of environmental law enforcement in China. And gradually, when I moved deeper into law enforcement, 
I wanted to understand how do firms actually respond to those rules. And as I looked deeper at how that was happening and also spend a lot of time next to those factories and trying to understand the different processes going on, I increasingly learned that everything I'd learned as a lawyer being trained in law was not really the way it worked. And at first I thought, okay, this must be China, it must be different. The more I read, the more I learned also, for instance, from the work of, from the work of Kerry, many others in the field of regulatory studies and criminology, the more I saw that that we needed this information really to understand the process through which all these regulatory rules that we make get to shape behavior. And that in the end, um, also together with Adam, whose expertise is in psychology and development of psychology and also in criminology, led to this book. The best way for me to explain sort of the gist of the book is to talk about seatbelts. If we go back to the early 1980s, um, very few Americans were wearing seatbelts regularly. Even though in 1973, every, uh, a new law was made mandating that every car should have a seatbelt. So every car had a seatbelt. Very few people were actually clicking in. Um, and we see that by early 1980s, about 15% of Americans was regularly uh, using their seatbelts. And this changed. And law was really a major part of this. First, individual states, um, had these mandates where they made it mandatory to use your seatbelt. Then seatbelt usage shot up in these states from 15 to 50%. So simply making it a rule that you have to made it go up to 50%. Then we saw that, that states adopted these click it or ticket campaigns, very low fines, no more than hundred bucks. Um, but again, it went higher. Then we saw that um, uh, different state authorities started these, um, these public messaging campaigns. They had these uh, crash test dummy videos. They went to schools with car racks. Again, it shot up. Then after that, we see that car makers introduced these warning beeps. If you didn't click your seatbelt in, um, there would be warning beeps and it's very uncomfortable. They're still there. It's not really nice to drive around with these beeps. But at the deepest level we see nowadays, about 85% or higher in most states, and the worst state is actually New Hampshire, uh, but in most other states, um, most people wear a seatbelt and they're not even thinking about it. So here we have this story where it was normal not to wear a seatbelt to a state where it's normal, where we don't even think about it anymore to wear it. And that in short is the behavioral code. And what's at play here, part of it is very visible. So it's very visible, uh, law enforcement is a very visible aspect and something we all talk about. These are the extrinsic motivations that are clearly the field of where lawyers are thinking about this. But a lot of the, th the, the processes here may have been less visible. What I'll do today is, 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 is go with you through the book and sort of draw out these other mechanisms here. So we'll look at the intrinsic motivations, but we also look at the situational um, influences, the capacity of people to have a, to obey rules and the opportunity they have to break rules. So if we start with the most visible one and we, we talk about different extrinsic motivations. We also talk about liability and tort as well as rewards, uh, subsidies uh, and other forms of, of positive incentives. But by far the largest part of, of what most of us think about when we, if we think about extrinsic motivations is punishment. And what you see here on this slide is the frustrating truth or, 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 or empirics as we know it about punishment. So first of all, we have very poor evidence. Uh, establishing the, co the causal relationship between punishment and illegal or damaging behavior is very difficult. And uh, all the state of science we looked at, we find again and again and again in different fields for different types of punishment and different types of illegal behavior, we find similar findings that there's inconclusive evidence that stricter punishment in of itself is enough to reduce violations. For regulatory, for regulatory scholars, the best reviews have been developed by Natalie Shell Bushy uh, in collaboration with Sally Simpson and Melissa Rory and others showing that for corporate, um, uh, for corporate violations, similarly, we don't have a um, overall proof that stricter punishment is enough. Does it mean that it never works? No, it doesn't. Uh, so for instance, there is evidence that for traffic violations, higher punishment does reduce uh, traffic violations. 
Uh, and I'll get back to that, sort of the, the evidence-based in a little bit. What we do know is that the certainty of punishment is vital. You need to have a threshold level uh, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of being uh, caught and punished, that the chances of that are high enough for a punishment actually to start working. So it means that it's much more important to focus on making sure that uh, illegal behavior is detected and then followed up by sanctions, then rather making the sanctions as high as possible. The third point is that whatever we do in punishment, we organize objectively, is not how it arrives subjectively. And this means that we have to communicate. So an ideal situation is a situation like we have in the Netherlands with the tax authorities. Uh, people overestimate the chance of being caught, as well as the strictness of the punishment for, for, for individual tax evasion. So uh, the authorities don't need to do much, but people think, wow, it's a lot. But what happens a lot is that the opposite is true that even though there's a lot of law enforcement, the perception of this is that the chance of getting caught is low and also that the, the, uh, the expected punishment is low. What this means for law enforcement is that it's about communication. And I'm happy to talk more about that during Q&A. Finally, and this is more about uh, ordinary crime, but we may be able to translate it also to, regu to regulation. Uh, the latest uh, evidence in criminology um, has looked at this called focus deterrence, really shows that a combination of punishment with other interventions works. So let's look at these other interventions. Um, before I do so, I, I won't go through this whole slide, but if you read the whole book, you'll be able to sort of um, understand the different things you can expect punishment to achieve. And it can have uh, seven positive effects, and 10 negative effects. And it depends on the type of punishment, it depends on the type of, 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 of the way the punishment is organized and the type of behavior that you're looking at, which of these is at play. But it's very useful, I think, uh, for anybody who's involved in making policy about law enforcement or regulatory law enforcement, or even in-house when, when you're trying to enforce, enforce corporate rules, to think beforehand, okay, what are the expected things and how do I uh, enhance the positive and, and prevent the negative? I'm also happy to talk more about that during Q&A. So let's move beyond punishment and look, let's look a little bit at the intrinsic motivation. So to do so, let's go to Arizona State Forest. Uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful national park there and Adam actually lives quite close by. And they have these uh, petrified um, trees, these fossils with these beautiful stones. And the problem was that a lot of people started to steal these stones and they weren't as big as these logs. A lot of them were much smaller. Um, and it was just a problem they couldn't solve. They started to work with social scientists to deal with it. And they worked, the key one was Bob Cialdini, who, um, who, who taught at the Arizona State University, who was a psychologist. And he had a theory, he had an idea, and, and it was that the communication about the theft was wrong. And the communication would be something like, look, uh, every year, tons of, of wood is stolen and your national heritage is, is destroyed. And in his idea was, look, they're actually activating what he called a negative social norm. They're showing that it's normal that you're stealing. So he did an experiment. He placed signs in different parts of the park and uh, he did different experiments. But one of them was that the sign had the same text, but it had a different picture. One had a picture of a lone thief and the other had th three thieves. And he compared how much wood was, was stolen at the different signs. And he left wood to be stolen there and he observed whether they were stealing. He found that with the three, the, simply having a sign with three, three thieves led to five times as much wood stealing as the lone thief. And there's a deeper lesson behind all of this. And that deeper lesson is that we as humans don't make individual decisions. So a lot of the thinking about extrinsic motivation comes from this sort of amoral, individual rational choice model. And um, part of this is it's not individual. We're very much social animals. So we're, we're influenced by those around us. And there's two situations. One is a negative situation. If you see others breaking rules or if you think others think it's okay to break rules, you're more likely to do so as well. And there's a big lesson here. A lot of times when we communicate about rules or about regulation, we tend to talk about, okay, there's so much damage being done. So we might try and persuade people not to do it as they did in the, in the, in the Arizona state. Um, or uh, we might try and scare people off with a deterrent message. Well, we caught this many people breaking the law. 
When we do that, we may send two messages. One is a message that tries to get people to do the right thing, either through persuasion or deterrence. The other side is we are sending a message that it's happening a lot. And the evidence is that that second message is very powerful and will shape behavior. So there's a risk of activating negative social norms. There's another side to this is there may also be positive social norms. And sometimes when we introduce extrinsic motivations, such as punishment, may also be liability, but even rewards, it may crowd out these original positive social norms. So you have to be really careful when you're introducing extrinsic motivations that you understand the sort of intrinsic motivations that already exist and that you build on them rather than undermine them. Part of this story is also about the, the legitimacy of rules. We know through the work of Tom Tyler and all the others that followed his work or worked with him or did their own work that people obey rules either A, because they agree with the rules, and that's very powerful, but obviously not everybody agrees with all rules. I mean, most people don't like to pay taxes, yes, yet most people do pay, end up paying taxes, but they don't just comply with rules out of fear of punishment they, or because they think others do it. They also do so because they think it's the right thing to do. So they have a sort of sense of obligation to obey rules. And a very successful regulatory or legal system really builds on that and makes that stronger. Here, one of the key things is that you have to make rules in a way that's, that's procedurally fair and also enforced in that way. So all in all, what we advise is, look, understand this, make sure that when you're introducing rules into an environment, whether it's a community or a market or a society, that you understand what sort of the are the intrinsic motivations that are playing out here. In the book, we go much deeper and broader into this. We also look at morality, sort of ethical decision-making, also about personality. Uh, I mean, a lot of the work that Adam and I have done has been about what we call rule orientation, how people individually develop this sort of obligation to obey the law. I'm also happy to talk more about that later. Now let's move from the sort of motivation into the uh, capacity people have to obey rules. And to do so, let's look at this image. This is an image of Maria Sharapova, the formerly famous Russian tennis star, but she's not happy. And she's not happy because she's here in the um, Hilton Hotel in LA, and she's not just there, she's in a press conference she organized to admit she had broken the rules. She admitted that she used meldonium, which is a substance, is an, is an illicit um, um, a performance enhancing substance that she'd been using. And she'd been using it quite a while because she had a medical condition for which she had been using it. It had been banned a month before she was caught, caught using it. And she says during this press conference, look, I did wrong, I broke the rules, but I have to say, I was not aware that the rule had changed. And there's an, in, there's an interesting point. On the one hand, we all know um, that not knowing the rules is not an excuse to break them. The question we ask in our book, which is typical of our book is, okay, but can we expect people to be able to follow rules that they don't know? And this really is, is a vital question. And it brings us to the idea of that um, compliance, and the way rules get to shape behavior very much depends on whether the people we address or the communities or corporations that we address with the rules, whether they're able to follow the rules. And here there's um, also some empirics. One part of the empirics is, and I did a separate chapter on this in the Cambridge Handbook of Compliance, is most people don't know most of the rules. Um, this is so for lay persons, most ordinary Americans don't know state criminal, uh, sta I mean state criminal law. They don't know their basic labor rights and they actually underestimate their rights to their own, uh, to the detriment of their own interest. Most people don't understand family rules and uh, don't really know what happens in case of divorce and other, other types of conflicts. But it's also for specialists. Doctors don't really know uh, medical law that well. Uh, school administrators don't know educational law. And I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of lawyers don't really know all the ethical rules that apply to them because I used to teach legal ethics to law students and I graded the exams and I know how well they knew it. And it's only part of them now. Part of the problem here is that the amount of rules we have and the complexity of rules uh, defies knowledge and defies a cognitive process. Uh, one statistic I came across was that by the late 1990s, and I don't have more recent numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's worse now, American corporations 
um, were regulated by over 300,000 rules backed by criminal sanctions. Okay, imagine you're a, a higher level manager in an organization. Um, let's say you have a staff of 30 lawyers advising you. These 30 lawyers would then each have to A, know 10,000 rules each, B, have to communicate these rules to you in such a way that you can understand them at a, daily, at a daily basis and that you can communicate them lower in your organization. Of course, this is silly. Of course, that's not how law works. Law works more that if you break one of those 300,000 rules, somebody at some point will find out. And if that happens, you get lawyers who will do research into those rules and then find the appropriate rule and apply it. That's how we're trained as lawyers. What our book argues is an ex ante view of law rather than ex post. So ex post, all of this works fine. Ex ante, which is all about, okay, you have a rule and that rule is going to, ch to change my behavior in a corporate or societal or market setting. I have to so sort of come to make decisions in line with that rule. Once we take an ex ante view, you really have to understand, okay, how does that rule actually get to come across my desk or my sort of uh, space where I, I, I then um, come to, to comply with it. We look at several other things here and I won't go in, in depth. We find, for instance, that lack of self-control, uh, that people are more likely to break rules if they lack self-control. Um, and we look at all kinds of interventions here. It's pretty interesting to translate that to regulatory sphere where it really hasn't been done yet. We don't really, even in white collar crime, we don't really talk about the person uh, very much. There's been some work, but not a lot. Socioeconomic conditions, a lot of work there. Uh, we can talk about that strain. Um, and, and what it means, in the end, you get a very different view. And I think for regulatory studies, uh, Bob Kagan and John Schultz's 19, 1984 article sums it up pretty well that sometimes regulators have to be educators. So sometimes you have to give the support and the treatment rather than just be a cop or a politician. Next, we move to another situational aspect, which um, is summed up pretty well by this picture. Here you have a picture of what is supposedly, a, a, I mean, according to Google Pictures, a, a German motorcycle in the 1970s. And in, and in 1976, the West German authorities mandated that, um, that motor riders wear helmets on their bikes. They introduced a fine to, to enforce this rule in 1980. And we see something interesting happening. In the 1970s, if you look at the motorcycle theft data, it stayed stable. Uh, until 1976, still stable. Until 1979, still stable. But 19, by 1980, when they started to enforce this motorcycle helmet rule, it suddenly dropped. You got fewer motorcycle thefts. We don't see a similar drop in thefts for cars. We also don't see that for other variables, for instance, the amount of youth that there was in society. And we know that youth, if you have more youth, you're going to have more, more, uh, more crime and also more motorcycle thefts, that it didn't rise. And what, they, uh, what, what researchers found was that by mandating the helmet, it became more difficult to steal a bike. You would have to be more premeditated, bring your own helmet, uh, or be able to steal the helmet with the bike. But often that wasn't the case. And you really stick out like a sore thumb if you're riding a bike without the helmet at some point when it's normalized to wear the helmet. And this, this leads us to an understanding of the opportunity approach to illegal behavior, the opportunity approach to regulation. And that's really an approach where you have to look for the speed bumps. It's a very different way of thinking. And it's just one of those things that can be, be really useful um, in, in addition to everything I just said. If you're going to follow this approach, you have to ask how does a certain form of unwanted behavior take place? You have to understand all the ways that enable it. And then you're, you, you have to think about, can I take one out as a regulator? So you sort of want to take a wedge out. Um, and I think some of this has been, been popularized through the book Nudge, I think situational, uh, but there's older and I think more deeper thinking about this in criminology, in opportunity criminology, situational crime prevention. But there's also work, for instance, that links it to architecture, uh, street lightning, but we can also see it, for instance, in uh, getting rid of, of big, big, big denominations like the 500 euro bill or the 1000 US dollar bill. There's a lot of different issues here. Of course, there's limits can easily lead to victim blaming. And also, of course, it will always limit choice and freedom. Finally, I'm, I'm getting to the end of the book. Maybe most interesting for the audience here is organizational mechanisms. 
um, uh, key here is, 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 is that what we're looking at in the end in organizations is more than just individuals. And what we try to do is look at, okay, what evidence do we have for the organizational interventions to work? And what we found is that both for compliance management systems, um, they do work uh, under, circum under, cir under certain circumstances, but the evidence is still limited. And what I, I mean, I found really striking is they work best where, in my eyes, we need them the least. They work best when there's good external oversight, when there's a good internal commitment by leadership and a good internal culture. What I saw when I read through many of the different studies also on whistleblowing is organizational culture kept coming back. Um, and this is a difficult one. I see also when I talk with regulators and I have a whole new project on organizational culture, it's hard to really know for sure what an organizational culture is. There's all kinds of surveys and they do predict some things, but once you go to a deeper level, it's, it's hard. It, it, I mean, the more you learn, the harder it is to really find out. But also it's really difficult to change it. And I'm happy in Q&A to talk more about this. Um, we, we do really go into this by looking at three cases, Wells Fargo, VW, and BP, to kind of unpack sort of what was at play there and how that actually was a cultural issue, which was very hard to do to a compliance management system or even, even whistleblower systems. Let me get to my conclusions. First of all, there is a behavioral code. What does that mean? That means that when we're looking at regulation, when we're looking at law and we're trying to, to see how we can best make law function and regulation function in a way to reduce harm, we need to understand sort of the underlying mechanisms at play. Um, and we show these the, for each of these mechanisms what we know and what we don't know. In all of this, what is really key is that apart from the exposed view that we often have in law schools, and I'm not saying that that's bad, it's really important, we also need an ex-ante view. We need to look at these, the nitty gritty of the mechanisms and processes and how they shape regulated, I mean, regulated responses. I see in the sort of regulatory work that we have, we have a tradition here, but we also have a tradition of sort of being much more macro, sort of big theory, big ideas that we can't really link or we don't often link to the sort of nitty gritty of the, of the empirics. We like to think in incentives and there's nothing wrong with that, but we have to sort of link these incentives to the other aspects of the behavioral code. And on all of this, it's important to be evidence-based, but also cross-theoretical. I think there's too much work on the academic side that is sort of trying to prove a point in one theory, whereas reality is, at least the more I'm reading, it doesn't really capture itself in one theory. And it's much better to combine them, which of course is very hard. Let me talk finally about the challenges in all of this. Um, so, so the first one is, okay, how to get law schools to really do this also. And of course, law schools are very successful at what they do, but I think there's a big opportunity here. More and more jobs are regulatory, more and more jobs are compliance oriented. And I think for those jobs to really be prepared well, you have to know the law and you have to know, you know how to argue it, but you also have to know how the law then gets to function and work. And I see that when I talk with regulators and people in-house uh, and even in law firms, I was just talking the other day with a law firm who had a lab they actually hired a whole bunch of behavioral specialists that actually give legal advice combined with, with, with social science advice. So there's a market here and I think law schools should just enter that market as well. Um, we're and the academia are way too siloed. I think regulatory scholarship has been different, but still uh, combining these different perspectives into one and not just trying to prove points on singular theoretical uh, uh, aspect is really important. At the same point, I think as, as scholars, we have to be more honest. One of the big things I found doing this research is how humbling the amount is where we don't know or where we're not sure. Also, I think we have to be honest where we don't know and, and are not sure and not offer a quick fix. Our book, uh, it's accessible, I think, uh, it's readable, but at the same point, we try to make a point, we're nuanced. You're not gonna get a quick fix for what you wanna solve. In my honest opinion, anybody offering you a quick fix is not offering you something that will really fix it. It may be quick, but I don't think it will fix. Fi finally, final point is, even if you go through all of this, um, anybody working in regulation is part of a bigger political environment. And in the political environment, some of the empirics, even if there's clear empirics, they don't land very well. So if we have the next financial crisis, everybody's gonna say, let's punish these CEOs really strongly. If then I, somebody like me says, well, great, if you want to do that, I mean, if that may be fair, 
but don't expect it in of itself to, to cure the whole, the whole problem. Politically, that's not a very acceptable message. I think it's really important to also engage, which Adam and I have been trying to do, to engage with a broader audience to discuss what are the empirics and why it's important, and also to understand better why certain of, I mean, parts of the science do land and parts don't. Okay, I think um, I'll leave it at that to keep enough time for the Q&A. I thank you all so much. Uh, any questions, you can email me or Adam directly, and I still have to thank all of you for being here also on behalf of Adam. Great. Well, we also invite uh, you to enter your questions in the Q&A, and I see some people have already done so, uh, as others are gathering. One uh, additional element to your opening story about the shift in patterns of seatbelt wearing in the United States that has a legal and behavioral and compliance focus is how it came to be that all of those 49 states, other than New Hampshire, adopted mandatory seatbelt laws. And uh, it came about after a long saga at the federal level, where the federal government was trying to put in place passive restraint requirements and, and mandate that automobiles be manufactured with air, expensive airbags. And uh, after losing uh, some efforts in the courts, it, the, the federal rulemaking went back to the Department of Transportation to revisit it. And uh, it was Secretary of Transportation Elizabeth Dole, uh, who was the wife of uh, the recently uh, deceased uh, former Republican presidential candidate Robert Dole, who, who came up with this scheme. And it is kind of a structural uh, solution, which is uh, part of the story that you tell about what makes people comply. Well, the structural solution was the federal government adopted a, a mandatory airbag passive restraint rule, but said it won't take effect if the country comes under state laws mandatorying, mandating uh, the wearing of seatbelts. <laughs> and so that gave all these automakers, the incentive, rather than going and trying to beat up on the federal Department of Transportation over their, their regulation, to go out and lobby in all of the state legislatures for mandatory seatbelt laws. And uh, that was really the, 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 what started that whole uh, shift toward uh, state uh, mandates on, on wearing seatbelts. So, uh, so a fascinating additional layer to the story that I think uh, reinforces a lot that's in the book. Um, I wanted to just, speaking of the book, just invite you, uh, Benjamin, at the opening to speak to any policymakers or legislators or their staffs who may be joining us on this call or maybe future uh, policymakers uh, among our students. Uh, what lessons do you take away from the book or would you want policymakers to take away from your book about improving law or using law to uh, solve new and emerging problems? Yes, uh, thanks for that question. Also, thanks for that addition, by the way. I think it's, it's wonderful. I didn't know that story. I mean, the book does cover the National Highway Authority's attempts to um, mandate these sort of um, uh, ignition lock things right. where you couldn't start without clicking in, where then Congress came in and banned the National Highway Authority ever right. to adopt a rule like that again. And I thought that was an interesting sort of interplay as well. Um, yeah, that's the earliest they... part, right, exactly. And it's this yeah. middle portion between that and the yeah. state laws is what yeah. happened. Uh, well, with, the funniest with, thing is they yeah. also made a rule then that the warning beeps could not be longer, I think, than eight seconds, where later research showed that they only start to work at 16 seconds. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and car manufacturers voluntarily made them later in, in the proper way. So there's a whole backstory there. And you're right that the, the book doesn't cover the process of rulemaking, but of course that's vital in all of this and also the whole politics and the human side to that. Mm -hmm. Advice, so, so, so I think the core thing from the book is to start by making the question of how will I get the rules to come to work central? 
I think once you make that question central, it's often sort of seen as a secondary question. I mean, I know in, in the 20 years I've been researching this, most people, especially people that I met from a law background, or sort of economics background, they assume, well, if we do this, we have to get the incentives right, it will work. I think once you make that, that, that question central and you follow it through, you, uh, you realize, okay, I need data. So the first thing you need to do is get people, if you have the room, to be able to go through relevant studies that apply to your field. So my book will give you an overview, that's great, but your particular field you're in, uh, you have to get the data for that. I mean, it's, I mean, there's just too many fields for me to cover. Second, having a team of people that understand the data and then can sort of look at, okay, what are we doing and how can we improve that? And there's a lot, there's gonna be a lot of lower hanging fruit where you can communicate better, you can leverage more, for instance, from your enforcement. Um, but there's going to be also things where you really have to look at complex types of interventions. So I think the book Nudge gives you a lot of the lower hanging fruit, which is great for better pro-social behavior. But if you really are facing, let's say, an anti-money laundering, or you're facing complex industrial pollution, or you're facing some of these uh, more uh, complex, multiple people, more ingrained, deeper in a market, then you want to if possible, get a team of people either in-house or not to start working on that. That's the first advice I would give is, is to broaden the knowledge base or to at least look at, okay, which people are making decisions here and do they have the right knowledge and access to that? I think that's the best advice I, I can mm -hmm. give. What about, and one question that, that came in from the audience, what about at the regulators themselves and the enforcement agencies? There's cultural issues there as yeah. well. Uh, do you have any insights uh, about what might be the, in addition to, to what the knowledge base needs to be to make regulations well, but also then to study enforcement, would that also be part of the culture of learning that, that would need to be at an at a, at a, a excellent regulator? No, 100%. So, so and, and, and yes, it can be about the enforcement. I think it's also broader about the regulatory agency. So first of all, it's really understanding your own context and your own incentives and questioning them. And I think the same applies for compliance managers in-house. I've done a lot of sessions with, with multinationals in the Netherlands over the last months, and also talked a lot with, with different regulators in the Netherlands for this, this organizational culture project we're doing. What we're seeing, everybody's part of this bigger context that they don't control. So politicians or uh, elected officials or other stakeholders will have an influence on your overall policy. And the bottom line is gonna be, look, you have to show that you do a good job. Showing that you do a good job often means showing output, number of cases, maybe that you enforce, not necessarily impact because that's much harder to measure. So really reducing pollution, um, it will be much more ad hoc. So there's gonna be a major incident it's gonna be much more um, sort of, I mean, deflecting blame. And that's not just at the, at the, at the agency levels, at the individual level. So understanding that I think uh, is a vital precondition because if you're just gonna tell people, well, ideally you should, you should be doing A, then you can't really do that. I think it's also being aware, which I think everybody is aware of, of your own organizational limitations. If you just don't have the funds to do, let's say a gold standard program, with all bells and whistles, try and find a program with the right behavioral influence that does fit sort of your regulatory capacity. So I think it's matching this sort of science that we're talking about with your institutional context and capacity. The other side I would say is try and, and I think there is good collaborations with academics where the academics can really play a role in trying to shape that external context. People like, like Kerry, people uh, like, like many of the other colleagues in the field, we have a platform where we're not bound by companies or regulators to talk about sort of the, 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 the enhancements that are necessary with people in politics and making sure that, 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 that sort of silly ways of incentivizing regulatory agencies that don't work, that they get criticized. So I think we have that role to play as well. And one comment, I think, coming in from the audience, uh, I think reinforces the idea of constantly being open to learning and yeah. being vigilant and, and, and humble. Uh, the, the questioner points to the situation in which rules might change behavior in unexpected ways. Actually, a couple of questions point to this. Uh, one questioner points to, for example, moral hazards. So if you make automobiles... Yeah 
uh, safer, and maybe people want to buy the most safe automobile, but then they're willing to drive, you know, 75 miles an hour on the road. Uh, and, and there might be a relationship between that, right? But another points to the experiment in which the, the fines for picking up children late crowded out the extrinsic motivations crowded out the intrinsic ones yeah. as well. What is, an, what is maybe an even more vital example here, which is uh, has been modeled actually by operations management scientists and has been discussed also by criminologists, is sort of the cat and mouse game you get if you if you if you have more stringent fines or you invest more in detection, maybe it becomes more optimal for a regulated company to invest more in evasion. And maybe the company is always going to be one step ahead. So it's these things to be aware of. I mean, to add one thing to what I said earlier, it is also what knowledge you combine. I think it's quite clear by now that we are drawing a lot on behavioral economics, and that's great. But I think you need to broaden the team. So I think uh, psychologists, and they're used more and more, and in the Netherlands, most teams have them. But I also really want to stress how important criminologists and anthropologists are. So some of the core teams I know that NetWest, the, the UK bank for me, the Bank of Scotland, they have anthropologists in their team. I know that some of the uh, Dutch environmental regulators, they have a behavioral unit that also has a criminologist. So I think that broader base, I've seen that work really successfully. So a lot of the best work that we would think of in, in, in empirical social science, criminology and other disciplines would take the form of a randomized control trial. Yeah. And when it comes to law, uh, how does one do that? Uh, it's not as if we can randomly assign different laws to different people. It's not quite the same as other kinds of experimental settings. Uh, plus, as one of the members of the audience points out, there's a movement toward regulatory harmonization across cultures that might even limit the degree of variation across jurisdictions. Um, how do we learn? How do these uh, the, the social scientists who might be in a unit at a regulatory agency, how could they learn? I mean, Ian Ayers and Michael Abramowitz and Gayer Listakin have this article called Randomizing Law, and they argue that there might be ways uh, to uh, learn from variation. In fact, uh, the Administrative Conference of the United States has a as a recommendation about trying to learn from variation in 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 the in regulations, um, is would that be a, how how you would advise uh, uh, regulators well, to inform themselves of these uh, these methods of of improving compliance and shaping behavior? Yeah, I mean, of course, um, the problem is even if you have different rules. So, for instance, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of the work on capital punishment, for instance, looks at state differences. But there's so much, I mean, in these natural experimental settings or quasi-natural experimental settings that you have to control for that it's still hard to come up with true causality in the evidence. Um, there's, there's different things you can do. So first of all, you're talking about randomizing the rules. But actually, if you have similar rules, we can randomize the interventions to get these rules to work. So for instance, one thing I've been involved in with one company, a big hardware company, we have reduced their anti-bribery policy from 24 pages to one page. Um, and we've looked at sort of the cognitive effects. So we've looked at, do people understand these rules better or not? And is there, I mean, I mean, what gets lost if you go from 24 to one page and what, and, and, and what is gained? I know other um, um, organizations have been doing A-B testing. So they try, they try different ways of ethics training, um, one way or the other. I know the Dutch uh, uh, tax authorities for years have, I mean, since the early 1990s, most tax authorities are, are pretty good at this, have been trying, for instance, uh, do versus don't rules or all these prospect theory type interventions with loss aversion versus um, gains, which they can actually set up differently in how the taxes are, are um, are are collected even if you have the general rules the same can be randomized. Um, similarly, in criminology, the best evidence actually we have across the book is about treatment of criminals. I mean, of, of convicted. I mean, people that are are incarcerated. Um, there is hundreds of thousands of cases where different treatments have been assigned with control groups where we really have good data. The problem, I think, is 
we're never going to have ideal data. And if we're just going to focus on those areas where we can actually have good measurements, we're going to end up with the stuff that's easy. So where you have a clear intervention where you can control for other variables. And I think it's good that we do that, but I don't think we should just be looking at uh, only cases where we can do these, these randomized control trials. I think we also need to use other, 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 uh, other mechanisms. So one part of what I'm working now on is also using complexity science where we can actually simulate. And we can actually run simulations to try out what happens if we change a certain variable and what would happen with other variables. I'm not saying it's the same quality of causality. I mean, it's not as a true randomized control trial, but at least it gives us more insight into more complex forms of, of regulatory interventions. Well, Benjamin, I want to turn to a question that quite a number of members of the audience have asked, and it won't be surprising uh, when you hear it. So what can we do to use law to increase vaccination rates uh, <laughs> against COVID? Yeah, great question. So since the pandemic started, I spent the first week watching Marvel movies with my kids and the second week trying to write some op-eds based on my general knowledge about uh, com compliance with the COVID rules as they were coming about. And then uh, when I saw that wasn't going anywhere, I just started my own surveys. So we have been studying compliance with the social distancing rules first in April 2020 in four countries, Israel, the Netherlands, UK, and the US. Then we continued over the summer in 2020 in the US and the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, I've been going at this because we still have social distancing rules until now. So I know social distancing quite well. The core thing there is, I mean, the one variable that really crowds out all the others, the ring to rule it all, so to speak, is capacity. People who, for whom it's easier to stay away from crowds, for whom it's easier to work from home, for whom it's et cetera, et cetera, they're more likely to comply. Uh, deterrence just didn't have any significant, uh, I mean, effect, uh, and other, other variables were at play to a certain extent. Can I generalize that to, va to vaccinations? No, I can't. So the only thing I can say about vaccinations would be sort of from my general sort of understanding of this. Um, first of all, I would say um, trust in government. I mean, I think everybody, I mean, there, there must be many, many programs also at the Penn program on regulation. I mean, trust is vital. So uh, if you're going to make rules, do them in a way that's really procedurally fair, that you're not cutting corners. Second, when you're communicating about this, when you're also, um, I mean, also leadership examples, etc. Second thing is social norms. Show how normal it is. So if you're communicating about this, don't just talk about, I mean, talk less about the people that are not getting vaccinated. Talk about the people that are. And if in your state or in your, your jurisdiction, that's a minority, don't worry. You can still talk about the growth in the minority. The book talks about this. There's evidence that's showing if you talk about that more people are doing it, even if it's going from 5% to 10%, that's 100% growth that will still have an impact. I think using incentives is a difficult one if you're gonna i mean i haven't i i don't know the data yet i know it's been tried it has the dangers of crowding out certain intrinsic motivations it may also backfire um, um and finally capacity make it easy make it cheap um, i think all, all all these things are done but i think the capacity part is really really important your 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 talk about things like public trust and leadership and legitimacy to the legal system suggest that there are foundational uh, factors that need to be in place really to have law make a difference. Uh, otherwise, I guess, other than just simply the threat of power. Uh, and, and, and when it comes to regulation or, or things, anything, Thing related to individual behavior in society, uh, it's very hard uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, for the government to marshal the resources to monitor everyone's behavior and try to induce uh, the, the compliance uh, uh, through, uh, through oversight. So a lot, of, a lot of compliance does depend on voluntary efforts to try to do what's, what's right. Uh, and that probably is going to be the, what, what the trust is so critical uh, for. Would you agree with that? And, and what would you say 
uh, you know, societies need to do today where we are seeing a decline in trust in government. Yeah. And this is across the board. It's happening in Europe. You see it in yeah. the Netherlands. Yeah. And yeah. it's certainly happening here in the U.S. No, it's, it's the question of our time. It's, it's also, in a way, unexpected question because, um, of course, we live in an age uh, where, where, where big, big things have been moving in different ways that, that, that make people feel less secure. And you're right. I mean, it reminds me of another seatbelt study that was done really early on where in, uh, in the state of Illinois and Yugoslavia, so in Yugoslavia, former, formerly known as Yugoslavia, they were in, going to introduce a, they were, they were going through a lawmaking process of having a seatbelt mandate. In Illinois, there was a lot of protest and real, I mean, a lot of people were against it. In Yugoslavia, nobody, I mean, I mean, there wasn't protest. Finally, they both made the rules. Once they were up in Illinois, most people complied. In Yugoslavia, nobody complied. So I think there's sort of bigger preconditions. I don't believe we can have a rule of law without a basic level of voluntary compliance. Hence again, why I said, just making the rule in the US, it shot up to 50%. That is so powerful. Once you have that, everything else becomes easier. And I've, I've always thought about this. If we have a new rule, let's say the ban on smoking, another really good example that Bob Kagan and others have studied, most people complied with it. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an mm -hmm. expert on how we build trust in society. There's a lot of good political science about it now. I'm not sure we know as societies. I think we all have opinions about it. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's also something that's me as a citizen, uh, both for my own country as well as in the US, but also China, where I still work, uh, is a really big question. But I don't have, an, have a science-based answer for you that it goes much further than, than what everybody would have. Well, and I also think, by the way, we do have to be careful about generalizing uh, about, about COVID in particular, A, because we have COVID coming at a time in which we really are seeing, uh, you know, uh, increasing polarization uh, and distrust in government that might also be at play. And, uh, you know, it, 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 there's not a lot to be said about just the fear that people have of catching COVID may have been a, the key factor driving a lot of the social yeah. distancing yeah. Uh, and maybe even the vaccine. I think that you know there's a new New York Times survey that uh, was out about a week ago that yeah. suggests that those people who are most fearful of catching COVID are the ones who are most vaccinated. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, the, the Times wanted to say that that's somewhat paradoxical, isn't it? Because they're technically the ones who are the safest. But in fact, it's, uh, there's a reason why they ended up getting vaccinated. <laughs> they were most concerned about it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, this is in our book, I mean, the, so, so first of all, on, on social distancing, we find this is one of the variables, but not the variable. So capacity is more than this. But in the book, we, we have a chapter which we call civil obedience, which is sort of the opposite of civil disobedience. That's the idea that people follow rules simply because they are the rules. Um, and, and, and there we, we, we as, I, as I said during the presentation, sure, we can learn a lot from the procedural justice work. So procedural fairness, making sure that regardless of the substance, that at least we agree on the process. I think that's sort of where uh, in many different sites, that's where the problem has come now. If you look at elections, sort of the pro we don't we don't really agree on the process anymore. I think mm -hmm. that's the hard thing now, where we also in law schools should really be thinking: How do you bring that back? Well, and let's bring it back to that and yeah. to uh, regulation, which you know predominantly focuses on organizations. I know we've been talking a lot about things like vaccine mandates and social distancing <laughs> rules that are individual and seatbelt usage are individually based. But regulation uh, is uh, not just targeting individuals as individuals, but individuals that, who are part of those organizations. Um, and uh, one question from the audience asked, you know, can you talk a little bit more about the culture or the factors inside organizations that make a difference. Volkswagen, the commenter, uh, highlights, uh, and and you, uh, you know, aptly state in in the book had a history in which management was really purposeful. Really, it had that toxic culture that you talked about uh, and talk about in your book. 
whereas Wells Fargo, uh, according to uh, the commenter, who I greatly respect and admire, uh, says it seemed like more of a case where management didn't really have good systems to identify the red flags. Um, it, does that make sense that there are going to be some organizations that just have this toxic culture and others that are just a little bit more slipshod and negligent in uh, not managing compliance very well? So first of all, when we're talking about culture, we shouldn't equate it just with leadership or management. So I think that's a really important insight first. So if we're talking about culture, we're talking about the structures, values, and practices within organizations that are both sort of at the, at the visible level from the outside. So you can see the building, you can see the rules, you can sort of maybe see the expressed values that the organization tells about itself to the external world. You may be able to see some of what it does. The deepest level, not even people inside are aware of it anymore. Those are sort of the what, what Albert Schein calls the hidden assumptions. So that's the first part. Second is um, organizational cultures, uh, they normalize what happens, happens in organizations. So it's what at some point, if you're a new member in an organization, what you see as normal. And what we did in this book, but also in an article that we did separately about the three cases, we looked at sort of seven aspects, and I won't go through all, of a negative organizational culture. I've, I've sort of stopped last year after the book was published to use the term toxic, because I think the word toxic is toxic. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so negative aspects. So the first one, and Wells Fargo really shared this, and, and, and also culture is not something willful. So, 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 so Wells Fargo shared this with B, BP and VVW, it's unrealistic expectations. Having goals that, don't, that are not met by sufficient resources. So for instance, at Wells Fargo, I mean, famously, they wanted to be one of the biggest banks in the world. They were just a regional player. And one of the parts, ways they did it was through setting this eight bank products per client. Just imagine that you're a bank employee, you somebody comes, they open an account, that's one product, you give them a credit card, second product, maybe one insurance, three, you still have five to go. That was the standard. Second aspect, I won't go through all seven, but this is an important one. Why didn't people speak out when there was unrealistic targets? Because there's a hampered communication. So we went through all these different aspects and the last one was really interesting. It's a cognitive, it's a, what we call corporate cognitive dissonance. When the tone at the top, and none of these, also VW, I mean, VW uh, was really environmentally aware, and they were really focused on environment, or BP, which was another case. They were the first major uh, oil company that actually acknowledged human-induced climate change, late 1990s. None of them say these things, even to the company or externally, so that is really nice message. But then if that is different from what happens at the bottom of the company and also different from sort of where the investment goes and where the real, the real money flows and where the, where, where the sort of promotions are, you get this disconnect and that undermines trust in what leaders are saying. And the hard thing is the new uh, compliance manager at, Vo at v v VW, for instance, after the scandal came in and had to leave again within a year because couldn't change what happened. Even Wells Fargo, if you have those targets, so it's easy, you're, you're after the scandal, you're the new compliance manager coming in. So the first thing you do is you get rid of the eight, pro eight products per client. But by that time, this has become normalized within the organization. They try to fire uh, the bad Apple employees and one branch in Colorado, they had, they had to fire everybody. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I mean, tens of thousands of employees were involved. So at some point, this is the hard thing. Once you really look at culture, you have to not only change the tone at the top or do a new value package. Now you actually have to do the hard work of really, I mean, cutting your bottom line, changing these kind of overly ambitious targets, increasing the communication internally and dealing with the way you, you responded to the scandal. And those are really hard things. Well, uh, the whole idea of using law to solve social problems, economic problems, uh, by changing people's behavior away from patterns that they're comfortable with, ways that advantage them and in our, are in their self-interest is really hard work too. But Benjamin, you and Adam have given 
us uh, here on this, uh, this, this, this seminar today, a, a great deal to think about and be better informed about solving that hard problem. Uh, and uh, with the book you, you've written, you've given anybody who reads it uh, a greater appreciation of both the difficulty that lies ahead, but also some pathways toward Im improving it and some certainly some some uh, dead ends to uh, to try to avoid and thinking that we can just uh, raise penalties, for example, on the books and expect that behavior will change. I mean, I think your, your, your point about how the tone at the top has to gel inside an organization uh, with the realities throughout all layers of the organization is really an important one. And it's consistent with this notion that the rules on the books, the law, as maybe lawyers can read it, doesn't always re equate to the rules in action. Well, that that's like a common theme that that runs throughout your book. And I think the challenge for all of us in the legal profession and in the academy and, and in um, the world of compliance is to try to try to take that gap between the rules on the books and the rules in action and kind of help close it. And you've given us certainly a lot to, uh, to work with and to learn from in, in making that effort. So thank you very much. Thank you and Adam for the brilliant book that I recommend everybody go out and buy and read. And uh, uh, thank you for your time uh, being here today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Gary. I uh, want to thank all the members of the audience and encourage you to go to the Penn Program on Regulations YouTube channel if you'd like to watch today's seminar again or catch any of our other uh, events that we post uh, online. Our next event will be on February 9th, 2022 with Professor Anita Allen from the University of Pennsylvania Law School talking about race and privacy regulation. So I hope you can join us then. Thank you again, Benjamin Ben Roy. Very, very great to see you again, and thank you for a wonderful book.